Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to talk about one of the thousand nations, a lot of the thousand cities blue, and that's inspired by a blog of the thousand nations blue, where I was blogging for almost two years. Uh, this blog started by Patrick Reboot, David's son, and uh, Patrick is also from the C study Institute, where I'm on the board. So for us, it's more about competitive governance, and so we'll talk a little bit about competitive governance. Before I get into letting the thousand cities bloom and thereby promote competitive governance, um, I'm going to give a little bit about my background and my approach to public anarchic capitalism. Sometimes I like to call it polycentric law or polyarchy, um, voluntary society. There are lots of different ways to describe it. Uh, I think anarchy scares people, and I'm all about not scaring people. I'm all about making it warm and friendly and nice and easy. Um, Already, our movement is, I would say, somewhat on the margins. In order for us to win, we need to make this mainstream and normal. So that maybe in another 20 or 30 years, 50 years, people say, you need to people who used to believe in monopoly in states. Uh, they, they used to believe in nation states. We, we need to have that sort of revolution in talk. I love to talk this morning because in state it's the most lack of imagination. We need to create uh, a positive image of the world where we are without nation states as we know them, or that we're gradually actually. To give you a little bit of background, though, I very much came to the left. Uh, somebody told me yesterday that Bastia sat on the left in the French National Assembly, which I think is appropriate. I feel like I'm on the left. And then I just happened to encounter arguments that made me convinced that anarcho capitalism is better than any kind of statism. That feels quite natural to me as the position of people who dislike hierarchy and would really want to break down hierarchies and for people who care about the poor. Um, I started out on the left. I went to the University of Chicago as a graduate student in order to prove the Chicago Congress wrong. I heard that they were people who pretended to be scientists in economics, but they believed in free markets, and free markets were evil, so I had to go and figure out why they made wrong turn. Um, after studying there for a couple of years, I realized that I was, ignorant. I was completely ignorant about economics and markets, and so I was depressed for about two years as I rethought all my premises. Uh, and I just simply Summer seminar in 1990 first introduced me to anarcho capitalism. Uh, even in, at the University of Chicago in the economic department, I encountered not a trace of anarcho capitalism. But at IHS, I'm Randy Barnett lectured there, uh, David Friedman, the machinery of freedom, freedom was there, and I was introduced to this beautiful Wendell <coughs> uh, world. Um, at that point, I was finished up a dissertation on ideas of culture of human capital. Uh, rather than finish my dissertation, I began uh, working in Chicago Public Schools. That led to a 15-year career creating private and charter schools across the U.S. Uh, based on a Socratic dialogue, which is my specialty as an educator. Uh, at the end of that 15-year period, I was at a school in New Mexico, which was at the time being ranked in the top schools in the U.S. charter high school. And I didn't have an administrative license because I'd never been educated as a real educator, so to speak, by the law. And I was being kicked out because despite the fact that school was performing really well, uh, we don't have a license to run it. So at that time, I happened to run into John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods Market. And he and I were introduced to a mutual friend, <coughs> who's also a libertarian entrepreneur. John and I quickly discovered that we very much uh, shared this identity of the left. We cared about you know, John Lennon, peace, love, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And we were not comfortable with some of the ways in which sometimes uh, the libertarian world felt right wing to us. We also, of course, didn't feel comfortable on the left because everybody there hates markets. So we created a new organization called Freedom Lights Our World uh, that is a nonprofit that promotes entrepreneurial solutions to world problems. The whole idea behind entrepreneurial solutions to world problems is, of course, if you're an anarcho capitalist, you believe entrepreneurs will solve all, all world problems. But there we're kind of focusing on the positive, constructive aspect instead of we need taxes, regulation, and government. It's flip side of the same coin, but uh, if you, if you attract more bees and honey, you do quite a bit of So our whole strategy is to make this uh, as, as warm and friendly to uh, left liberal idealists like we used to be as possible. Uh, in the course of looking at entrepreneurial solutions to world problems, quickly I ran into Mark Fraser. Uh, Spencer McCullough is here too. Spencer and Mark were both part of the network, hey Spencer. And uh, part of the wonderful network that I was introduced to by Lake Smith, a long standing libertarian. And Mark uh, had been involved in the free zone movement for uh, 30, 40 years. And free zones are something that really is not attracted enough attention from libertarians. Um, 
they have also attracted almost no attention from mainstream development economists. A few years ago, I had a, uh, a small workshop where Bill Easterly, a development economist, was there. And he said, Why can't you try to study free zones? And he said, Our mistake, we should have, they are important, we just been ignoring them. And of course, it's interesting that a full academic field could ignore some. The Drucker, on the other hand, said it wasn't something that free zones were the most important poverty alleviation uh, solution on the planet. And Drucker, of course, was not a traditional academic, a very original mind who saw what worked. Anyway, the thing with free zones, there are good free zones and bad free zones from a libertarian perspective and a real world perspective. So I'll just give you, and, and Mark, work with Mark led to uh, Bob Haywood, who's the uh, founder and CEO of the World Economic Processing Zones Association. He's now moved on to another program. But he also was very interested in free zones and way to alleviate poverty. So he and I wrote some papers together. Uh, in both cases, it turns out that some free zones are nearly crony capital. You can't have a free zone where uh, you're in charge of government, your buddy here wants a tax break, uh, you give him a tax break, maybe he pays you off ultimately, not ultimately, whatever. Uh, there's nothing much for libertarian life in those kinds of free zones. And there are plenty of free zones that are basically government moved office or corrupt crony capital. But there are also some free zones where there is, the you know, free zones really are an island of economic freedom in a more statist regime. And Bob Haywood makes the case, and I think it's quite plausible, that economic liberalization in South Korea and Taiwan and Mauritius and Ireland and in Mexico and China and India uh, is in part driven by free zones. And the logic of it, as he puts it, I think this makes a lot of sense, is that the most developing nations, you know, most developing nations are incredibly serious. Uh, the United States, as bad as it is, is um, one of the top ranked countries on the economic freedom of the world index. Most developing nations, basically the elites, uh, exclude almost everything else from the economy by means of the law. And in order to get around that, Jack Morris and Villori calls that the problem of the natural state. It's kind of natural to elites to exclude everybody else in his view. In order to get around that, what happens in the free zone is one subset of the elites have an opportunity to make more money by means of that economy freedom than they could by means of rent seeking. And at the same time, they're not threatening the rent seeking uh, approach of everybody else in the economy. And so if you can basically create an incentive for a subset of the elites to favor of violent economic freedom, they get rich, the buddies went in on that, and gradually expand economic freedom either through more free zones or in some cases nationwide economic globalization. Given the problem of public choice theory where government seems to grow inexorably pretty much everywhere, um, it's very interesting to us to see how you can create a dynamic which shifts things in the other direction. Instead of government growing inexorably, you have a, an incentive-based approach to creating more economic freedom. That said, free zones are by no means ideal from a libertarian point of view. It, they're long ways from uh, anarcho-utopia. Uh, I love the title of this conference, by the way, Libertopia, we need to think of the utopian idea. But if you think about the directionality from more statism to islands of economic freedom, incentivizing more economic freedom elsewhere. We wonder, is, is there a way to play with that a little bit? Now, one of the suggestions that Mark Fraser made, what if we used the land value gains from a free zone, and I'll switch to free city. Basically, a free city is a free zone with residential entertainment. You know, the free zone may just be manufacturing. The free city is full-blown, people live there and all that. What if you took the land value gains from a free city and used those land value gains to incentivize support for he points out that in a successful free city or free zone, take Shenzhen or Dubai, land values go up 10x, 50x, 100x over time, which sounds outrageous, except when you think about the fact that uh, those pieces of land, previous versions of this talk have given, uh, Dubai and Shenzhen 30 years ago were barren pieces of land. They had bad government on it. You put better government, economic freedom, and all of a sudden capital starts flowing in, businesses thrive. Uh, ultimately, Shenzhen and Dubai look much more or less like Tokyo, New York, Hong Kong, they're the real metropolises. So the idea is if you can take a piece of worthless land, put better rule of law, property rights, more economic freedom on it, you get tremendous land value gains. What if you use those land value gains to basically pay off anybody who needs to be paid off? And that's what's fascinating, but the conclusion is that it's a practical pay. So one of his versions is we could. Uh, give a certain portion of land value gains to government. Uh, and we think government, that's what it takes to get things to give some of the government. You can use some of the land value gains and go towards education and health care. So all the do-gooders around the world like you because you're subsidizing education and health care, perhaps only for the residents of the city. And you can also do a portion of land value gains to say that all the residents in a given region. This works best when you have 
a small region. But if you have tremendous land value gains and all the people are making money off the fact that the city has economic freedom, and if they understand that, maybe we can accelerate the dynamic towards more freedom. Uh, Mark has not been able to test this. I've got another number of projects around the world where I'm trying to promote this idea to get, say, real estate developers who are doing these projects with greater economic freedom to do this. And in some cases, the real estate developers get it. They see, wow, um, resistance could undermine our efforts to have more economic freedom here. Support from the people, from the government, from NGOs, and activists, that will help. Uh, they, they see that it's a worthwhile project. So now I'll shift a little bit to the whole uh, real estate development perspective. Um, people in real estate very often make money by changing a piece of land from its own residential to its own commercial. A lot of times in the U.S., a piece of land that's the zoning has changed will double or triple the price over that. Um, a lot of what a lot of real estate developers do is they go to city council meetings and they have a bunch of city council members and you know they make friends in the right places and they make the zoning change and they make a big pile of money overnight. So real estate developers can get this logic. And if they have a government that's kind of sympathetic already, if they have the lease within a region or country that's sympathetic already, uh, they can see how this game might work and it might be a really profitable game. Um, I've actually worked with some real estate developers in northern Mexico to see how doing something like this could provide them with a lot more wealth. Um, I think we need to have a whole global industry of real estate developers who get this kind of flipping in value. Uh, people who make money are smart. Uh, they, they have a game in the city councils. Let's, let's give them a sense of how to do this globally. So if you had a global real estate you know, development industry with private communities, say, in the world, and private communities that could attract uh, people from around the world, if they had security, economic security, and economic freedom, and the real estate developers are paying off government one way or another, paying off the people in democracy is a little bit more paying off government. So they're paying off the activists, they're paying off the people, they're paying off the government, all in, all in order to get more economic freedom. And everything's incentivized so that the more that the city grows, uh, the wealthier they become. Then you've got an interesting dynamic where all of a sudden the world cost making machine is pushed towards greater economic freedom. You get a long way from Libertopia. So the next step, and again, this is speculative, but you guys are Libertopia, so let's start speculating and see how far we can go. Um, right now, most people think that the laws of the nation state is almost identical to the nation state. You know, uh, the law of the US, the law of Britain, the law of Hong Kong, the law of France, so Dubai, about eight years ago, did something. Dubai wanted to create a world-class financial center. And they looked around the world and they looked at the most successful financial center in the world, London, New York, Tokyo, not Tokyo, London, New York, Hong Kong, Singapore, Chicago, Sydney, and all of those ran some version of British common law. And many of you may know that there's an active literature showing that British common law is better for economic freedom. Um, the rulers of Dubai, since it's almost a family business, it's a nation almost like a family business, they said, let's just hire a world-class British common law judge and a British common law on Dubai soil. The rest of Dubai runs United Arab Emirates version of Sharia law. So they've got one Sharia legal system throughout the country within 110 acres of Dubai, the Dubai International Financial Center. They've got a very prestigious British retired commercial judge, and they hired another prestigious retired Singapore commercial judge to administer British common law on the soil of the DIFC. Go to the DIFC website. It's interesting. It's the most customer-friendly legal system you've ever seen. Um, these guys are very much about how do we give investors and businesses the confidence to invest here. Um, one of the issues, of course, is what's the boundary between commercial law within the zone and Sharia law outside the zone. And that's, to some extent, a matter of precedence. So as judges make decisions, that state precedents as to what counts as criminal law, what counts as commercial law. The DIFC advertises those decisions. Um, when they run into controversial uh, situations within the commercial law, they advertise those decisions. Um, everything about the DIFC is how do you as an investor know that what they're doing is um, gives you the safety and security you know. As a consequence, at one point I calculated that the 110 acres of the DIFC had attracted about as much capital over a five-year period as all of sub-Saharan Africa, North and South Africa. They're just tremendous. You, you create a really safe place uh, where people know that their money's going to be safe, uh, and voila, you get you get the best of all the you know, golden stacks and city bank, all those all the big banks in there. So what I like best about that is not only the fact that it's successful, the fact that we've got this precedent of why do you need 
to make the nation state and the legal system the same. Why not think of it like an operating system? Sometimes we use Linux, sometimes Mac, sometimes Windows. Uh, what if you are in a nation state and you have these private developers creating these uh, free cities with more economic freedom? And instead of using, you know, say, Mexican law with a few tax breaks and a uh, few regulation breaks, what if you just install uh, some version of British common law on Mexican soil or Senegalese soil or Rwandan soil? All of a sudden, if you break this notion between nation state and legal system, interesting possibilities exist. Um, one of the ways in which this happened is uh, my wife happens to be Senegalese government, but actually she's a Senegalese entrepreneur. We are talking to ministers from the Senegalese government about the free city there. Um, they're very interested, but when I talk about this uh, different legal system, they say, how do we do this legally? Uh, because they do respect the rule of law, they have a constitution, and they have a legislature, and so forth. And unlike the rulers of Dubai, they do whatever they want. Most countries have to follow the rule of law, or at least pretend to, more or less. So the next stage is, uh, I ran into, ran into a libertarian legal scholar named Kevin Lyons, and he's been focusing on the fact that uh, right now, you can use a choice of law clause uh, and private arbitration in international business contracts. Most nations on Earth are signatory to something called the New York Convention on Arbitration, which means that if you are doing business in Mexico or Senegal and you want to choose to use Dutch law or Hong Kong law or U.S. law, you write that and get it to this dispute, and okay, so we have to go to the Hague to adjudicate this dispute. Um, so we've got this interesting precedent. We're already, you can pick your legal system anywhere on Earth. So far, this has only been used business to business. But we asked, what if we could extend this from B2B transactions to B2C, business to customer, and business to employee transactions? Um, at that point, you would have a means of importing a legal system from anywhere onto anywhere else. Now, whether or not you can do that depends on a lot of things. Uh, we're looking at this uh, arbitration in Mexico, for instance. And in Mexico, right now, it's absolutely forbidden to arbitrate employee law. But it's kind of an arbitrary distinction. Why can you have private arbitration, take care of a BDB transaction, but not an employment contract? And a lot of that is social norms. And if it was acceptable for a Mexican employee to have a contract with, them, say, Hong Kong law, then in principle, you could arbitrate it. So one of the ways in which we're pushing towards the acceptability, acceptability is to offer a choice of employment contracts. So if you're a Mexican employee and uh, we'll say you can, we can employ you under Mexican law at this salary, which is going to be low, or we can employ you under Hong Kong law at this salary. The big difference being that we can fire you easily under Hong Kong law. It's very tough to fire you under Mexican law. Do you want the high salary you need to fire you or the low salary you hard to fire you? And we educate the employees and film them and document the process. And hopefully, we will find people in the courts that would support that. Again, this is a speculative boundary where we're going. But I'm looking at precedent. So I love the DISC precedent of different legal system. And if we could have a different legal system that did not require a royal family, like the Dubai royal family, to insert it, um, and it was creating great wealth and leaving poverty with government bought off, population bought off, and the bought off, we would have an interesting way under existing legal rules to insinuate new legal systems around the world. So far, I've just been talking, to go more and more into the Libertopia direction. So far, we've just been talking about existing legal systems, Hong Kong law, US law. You can pick best of, best of class law. So if you're talking US law, we can get uh, corporate law, <coughs> Delaware, insurance law, from South Dakota, and so forth. But in principle, we could even pick uh, a new body of law, maybe US law circa 1900, or US law circa 1900 plus a few tweaks to stage for There's a whole process of uh, choice of law clause it doesn't say that you have to stick to existing existing body of law. So if we could come up with, uh, say, our ideal body of our utopia <coughs> law, and we could insinuate that into a choice of law clause. And now we'll talk about the private arbitrators. The private arbitrators, in essence, by the courts. And there have been a lot of anarcho-capitalist uh, scholars who have pointed this out. Um, you could also train private arbitrators in your choice of law. So if you created an anarcho-utopia law, and you had judges trained in anarcho-utopia law, and we have had maybe a decade or two of precedence of bringing more conventional legal systems into places around the world. Then, in principle, we could create little islands in our utopia law. Um, it would be helpful that these are win-win-win situations. 
you know, thinking that we don't want to uh, scare people in our first implementation of this. So one of the things I've always been, or I always emphasize first off is we're out of alleviation of poverty. At this point, there's an immense body of evidence showing that economic freedom leads to higher GDP per capita. Um, and on a local basis, you can show that we can create more jobs by means more economic freedom. Uh, I'm also interested in very uh, kind of imaginative and alternative spins on why economic freedom and these free cities would be good. One of the pitches I've made is uh, actually talk to Jane Goodall about a free city to save the chimpanzees, which sounds a little bit absurd, but again, if we have the Jane Goodall to trick save the chimpanzees on our side, we can get what they want. In that case, it turns out there's a reasonable chance that chimpanzees will be extinct in 30 or 40 years. Uh, the reasons are bushmeat and habitat destruction. If you have millions of hungry people and their chimps there for eat, I'm afraid a lot of them go. And also, if you need to burn wood and their trees out there, you can chop them down and burn um, All of the uh, you know, Jane Goodall books and all of the calendars of Chimbi, the chimpanzees on them, all the nice things that uh, American elementary school kids are doing to save that chimpanzee, chimpanzees are absolutely worthless. None of that will save one single chimpanzee. But if we could take a prosperous free city where millions of people Tanzania could get jobs and would come off the land and go into the city and work in factories and work in all sectors and develop real prosperity, you would quite spontaneously see a situation in which bushmeat destruction would slow down and habitat destruction would slow down. And ultimately, the revenue from using chimpanzees for tourism uh, would outweigh the uh, possibility of killing the eco. And you have a process in which chimpanzees were saved. So that's kind of one way in which I'm pitching this free city thing to everybody on the of left as a way to alleviate poverty, uh, help women. One of the proposals I have is the women's up, uh, in a common free zone, where we would give a portion of land value gains to groups that would help uh, women's causes. And there are, there are things like healthcare that are uncontroversial from our side, where you can have free hospitals that help uh, women's hospitals. So for my strategy is not at all about you know, yelling at people and beating them up, but it's not smart enough to be an early capitalist yet. Um, you know, might be, but you know, it doesn't help to say that. It's instead say, what do you care about? You care about chimpanzees, you care about poverty, you care about women. Um, what do you care about? Uh, what if we think out of the box at this imaginative way to help make things a little bit better? Um, one other little bit of this is war. Uh, there's a great deal of evidence now that most wars on Earth are civil wars these days. Most of the uh, deaths in wars are from civil wars. And civil wars are generally caused by lack of property rights, uh, weak governments, and in general lack of prosperity. Poor people can be recruited for revenue groups uh, and try to make money by killing and stealing things. It's much easier to do that than a failing country where it's one that's prosperous and growing and people have jobs, you know, decent security is much less likely to happen. So we are on the side of angels in terms of peace and prosperity uh, for the world, women and chimpanzees as well. If we can sell people on each of these steps, they agree, each of them is a little bit speculative, but if we sell them, then we have the global activist movements on our side. We've got all the real estate developers on our side. If we pay off the populations, we have the populations on our side. Kind of a, again, you guys are imaginative, so I'll tell you a lot of crazy details I've been playing with. Uh, most of this is hypothetical. Um, with cell phones, most people, cell phone density in Africa is uh, about the same as in the US. Almost everybody developed the world has cell phones these days. Um, what if you had some kind of signal going to poor people, showing them how their portfolio in the free city was increasing? And so when the newspaper said that you know, such and such company just established a plant in you know, free city Rwanda, and they see their portfolio go up 0.2 cents, that's exciting. Um, I calculated in rural Senegal, uh, an egg is probably about two cents, and in very small gains, can make very definite increases in the standard of living for a lot of people around the world. So if you have the populations understand this and see, you know, money in the bank and what we're doing, we get them on our side. Uh, at the same time, we need lots and lots of bright people, bright scholars working on this, um, bright uh, imaginary people with imaginations, writing fiction, uh, doing commercials, and marketing. One thing I think libertarians are poor at is marketing. Uh, we talk about you know, how we believe in entrepreneurs and business and so forth. Most real businesses spend a lot of money on marketing. I think most of us are in our left brain writing economics, arguing about law, uh, doing all of the left brain sort of activity. And uh, other than you know, science fiction writers have done good work, and random great work, 
but the kind of right brain inspirational marketing side of the movement is relatively weak. So we would need to have these three cities have world-class marketing efforts. And again, real estate developers already, they know how to do marketing. Um, if they understand that the increasing autonomy of the state is a crucial part of their wealth creation, they will start marketing along the lines that we want to market. And ultimately, we get a system where we subsidize more libertarian scholars, we subsidize or have our libertarian marketing subsidized because the real estate developers want it. We want law firms that get this and are in a for profit industry to create new legal systems around the world. Um, we want globally competitive industries and private creation creation. Um, right now, if you think about uh, trying to go against not only the U.S. government, but the World Bank, the IMF, the United Nations, all multilateral organizations, all of which are, are, are state supremacies to their <coughs> it, it's almost impossible to, to imagine being, being these guys. They're just overwhelming. And, and even at the free city level, these, these guys are powerful. Free zones have become somewhat more popular at the World Bank, but what that means is the World Bank and IMF are now advising developing nations in status version of the world like IMF style of reason, which are garbage. Um, so we, we need to kind of get ahead of the game and get things moving in our direction in terms of identifying real estate developers, law firms, uh, various kinds of economic development consultants, manufacturers who want to uh, create a new factory in the developing world that need a high quality legal system. We need to reach out to business communities, some of whom are already instinctively libertarian, a lot of whom are not very sophisticated about their libertarianism. And we need to gradually educate them on the enormous payoffs from creating a world of private law, private education, and ultimately uh, private creation of um, sovereignty. Um, with that, I'll, I'll kind of stop and open up for questions. It's a big, uh, all over the place sort of proposal, but uh, I, I've actually worked on some projects in Mexico, Rwanda, and Senegal, and would love to help anybody anywhere to make all this a little bit more real. Yes? I have not. Actually, another element there is uh, I, I've known, I forget, I forget the name, there's a guy who actually has made their, uh, the gangs somewhat quasi legitimate as police forces there in some of the um, you know, Basically, instead of having police fight the gangs all the time, uh, there's an attempt to legitimize them as if they're providing security and they're not violating other laws, let's go ahead and do that. I think that you know, would be a wonderful opportunity to have people who are our level of sophistication going there and say, Let's tweak this a little bit in our way. Uh, and again, part of this is almost nobody knows about our ideas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And part of this too is, I think, uh, thinking about when, when, and then sometimes you have real estate developers who say, oh, yeah, that's great, let's get rid of all. But if you can support people on your side and say, wow, when you participate in this, you get rich, uh, what can we do? Yeah, totally. Yeah, what you're talking about there reminds me a lot of Henry George. Well, sometimes I describe myself as a Georgist libertarian. I'm going to have one of the papers I'm going to write that I've written is the Georgist libertarian case, where basically this thing of uh, let's pay off everybody with land value gains, and in exchange for paying off everybody with land value gains, let's create radical freedom around the world. So yeah, I think, and then had a great conversation with Fred yesterday about this sort of thing. Yes. So you talked about uh, using uh, contracts between employers and employees in addition to between businesses to be able to have arbitration for various uh, different kinds of legal uh, approaches. Would there be a possibility for people who, in a particular area to sign an agreement that if there is a dispute between any of the people who signed this agreement just randomly in their interactions and if they don't have a business relationship, uh, that they would use a particular law system of law or arbitration? Uh, so you could also add that type of interaction uh, to this alternative legal system. Uh, absolutely, and a lot of this, uh, there's a wonderful paper by Ka Kaplan and Stringham on the privatization of disputes, and they make the case that if governments would simply recognize uh, private contracts, you know, never ever interfere with private contracts, that would be a path towards basically uh, libertarian utopia, uh, or an anarch anarchic utopia. One of the difficulties, of course, is on some kinds of contracts, the governments are likely to override them. And Again, because it's a fuzzy boundary, 
One of the things we want to, we, we don't want to try a contract that we know for sure the government would kill. Ideally, you want to gradually extend the realm of contracts where they allow us to do what we want. So it's a tricky business. Look, again, a lot of this is marketing and public relations. You, know, you want to identify contract opportunities where an outside observer would say the judge that struck that down was an idiot. You don't want to create contract opportunities where the judge who strikes the law down and the person can bring it down is a hero. So it's strategic in that sense. Right. Um, I'd like to, you know, to get your feedback on the idea that um, you know we need more or, or better marketing. Um, I, I think it's, it's instructive to look at the corporate world, you know, which is engaged in lots of marketing, and then by libertarian standards, you know, has arguably provided all these things, you know, new technologies, business developments that create jobs, enhance prosperity, and make, improve the quality of people's lives. You know, compared to the track record of governments. Yet, you know, with the general public, you know, which has a better uh, reputation? Uh, certainly with people on the left, you're talking about who you're reaching out to, uh, corporations arguably have a worse reputation. And I, I think it, you know, it relates to the perception that they're out to make a profit. And they're, you know, people don't want to be marketed to it. And young people in particular, I think, are increasingly resistant to marketing. And in fact, some of the cutting edge, you know, people and strategies in marketing I think it kind of started to come full circle and realize that the best marketing is not the market, in essence. Um, so I, I like to talk about you know, spreading libertarianism, sharing ideas, um, not thinking about it too scientifically. You when you know, marketing is kind of science, when you start thinking about it in those scientific terms that are sort of removed from treating people individually, then you know, it becomes alienating. You know, you really are treating them kind of cause and machine in a sense. And, and I think people intuitively pick up on that, even if they don't have the language for it, and it makes them actually more resistant. So that's what you're trying to do. Well, uh, in some ways, I'd say you're talking about old style marketing. And whether you want to use the term marketing, I think that even you know, the best companies, I, I'm a great fan of um, all the uh, Clue Train Manifesto, which yes. is one of the early ones yeah. in depth of depth yeah. of marketing. Things like transparency are totally different than transparency. And maybe marketing is not the right word, but I think some kind of sensitivity to how people on the other side might perceive it. Um, so yeah, I'm not talking about you know, heavy-handed corporate advertising you know, some time ago, but still I think a greater sensitivity to what the needs are, what our customers might want. Um, because if we're thinking in terms of serving customers instead of you know, arguing them to death, it's a different sensibility, even if we're uh, sensitive in exactly the way as you're suggesting. And speaking in terms of making the world better safe rather than... Precisely. And then just the other note on that is, um, I, I think you're right that government does bad things and gets away with it, whereas corporations do a lot of good and tiny bad things in our town. Um, a lot of complex, interesting reasons for that. I, I think evolutionary psychology does predispose us to kind of believe in government. So it's kind of, I think, um, seeing things as kind of like seems counterintuitive to people who get educated. And so for that reason, uh, my, my next book is going to be called Academia is the World's Leading Social Problem. Because insofar as academia is statist, and you know, through K 12 universities on the journalism, the whole system of ideas that are transmitted by academia uh, reinforce our evolutionary psychology, psychological status, it's a tough, tough road for us to you know, mark it all in the first place and be compelling. So we're going to do everything I need to do, what I'm talking about doing, and one of the reasons that, uh, for funding and libertarian and intellectual is we do need to have uh, land value games fund smart people to get it. Um, just one other kind of thought that came to me when I was looking at opportunities to do this, and actually 
uh, came by accident. Um, in the US, there are 564 Native American tribes. And in principle, it's actually a very strong legal case that those should be sovereign nations. The US is, in a big way, uh, you know, in violation of dozens of treaties. And if we could get islands of freedom on Native American tribes and make them wealthy, yeah, uh, one, of the, one of the inspirations for Love House Nations Bloom it was Peter Thiel's notion that the future of freedom depends on if we have more sovereign entities 30 years from now or fewer sovereign entities. And as the world you know, consolidates to a few sovereign entities, we're screwed. But if it expands to thousands of sovereign entities, they're screwed. And right now, in terms of you know, not only the US, but around the world, there are native uh, indigenous rights movements and indigenous rights pieces of land. If all of those became real sovereign entities that could do whatever they wanted and basically um, have their own legal system, uh, our movement will look very interesting. Uh, so actually, actually, as it turns out, I'm having uh, dinner with Russell Leeds tomorrow night. And uh, hopefully, all right. So I'll tell you tonight. Um, any other questions or comments? OK. Um, my website is flowidealism.org. Uh, I blog at Left House Nations Bloom. I have a book, Be the Solution, How Entrepreneurs and Conscious Capitalists Can Solve All the World's Problems. And if anybody wants to participate in this movement, uh, I'm happy to have uh, more hands to push it. Flowidealism.org. Flow, F L O W, idealism. I D E A L I S M. Thank you. <laughs>